you know participate in some of this educational platforms that are mustered in the country over the past say couple of years using the digital ecosystem because one of the challenges that i faced when i started my investing journey so sometime in 2008 2009 in a much more serious way so what we didn't really have is we didn't have access to these sort of educational platforms so end of the day what would happen is you would probably do some sort of formal study as part of your mba or maybe you would read a couple of investing books and then you know you would start off with a framework that is you know it looks very very theoretical at the beginning and then what tends to happen is you tend to follow those ideas as per the book and then you get the feeling in the first couple of years that the practical investing world is like something that's totally different so what works in us what worked in the us when all of these investing books were written some of the case studies that you read about let's say a fedex or a southwest airlines which i'm sure every b school student in the country has kind of read you keep looking for some of those parallels in india and then you realize that the indian market doesn't really have that sort of a breadth of offering so i guess what the the real advantage that people who are starting their investing journey today even as a retail investor i guess some of the platforms like yours are doing a fantastic job in terms of you know bringing practitioners to the table who give their practical insights and then that is where investors get the feeling ki the sort of experiences that i am having in the first say one or two years now it's not something that's really out of bounds this is how the entire thing starts so it's very good to you know participate in platforms like this so i guess social media presence is something that i traditionally have was pretty reclusive i wasn't really too much active other than just posting on value picker till about 2019 so 2020 given the fact that covid sort of broke through and we sort of had a lot of time on our hands no social environment no going out limited fitness activities as well so that's when i actually put together this entire website for congruence advisors and even today i continue to manage this entire website myself and it's been a fantastic learning in terms of you know learning the entire digital ecosystem carving out an own brand for yourself how do you sort of position yourself what sort of educational needs are out there with respect to the investment community right now so i think we are probably going through a period right now which is very very vibrant it's up to each one of us to you know sort of participate in this and get something really good out of it either we participate as an investor continue to do investing or in some cases you may be able to participate some as somebody like me who's become a boutique asset manager today or you may be able to participate in a different manner or, or as let's say an investor who sits a couple of businesses over the next five to six years so i think india is right now on the cusp of a tremendous amount of breakthrough that is happening on the investing and on the financial side so i think each one of us needs to be very very excited in terms of the amount of possibilities that we have you know going forward from here so tying this into what has my professional experience has been so i finished my engineering in 2003 and 2003 you didn't really have you know too many options as a decently well educated guy who was finished his engineering from karnataka so eventually you would get placed into one of the it services companies then the next logical step for people to aspire for would probably be to do an on site stint but for some reason i was very very clear saying i wanted to do my mba at the earliest possible thing so i did some amount of time in infosys then i shifted to oracle bangalore so in my avatar as a techy i was a database programmer i was doing erp coding on the oracle application platform so in the meanwhile i wrote cat got to a good b school so post my b school i guess i had the option of trying out a couple of let's say other sectors but then i guess i just stuck to something that was very familiar to me so i ended up taking a business development role with an it services company in process so then i kind of you know decided to stay back in india because of personal reasons so did a fair amount of i would say it product selling early on in my career and i was pretty young at that point of time i was hardly like what 25 26 so i got a chance to interact with some of the leading banks in india in terms of understanding what their technological requirements are so that was a fantastic experience but to be fair and to be very honest i think two to three quarters into the role i was very clear saying boss yeah this doesn't seem to be really cut out for me and i've written extensively about this in my blog as to why i came to the conclusion that i was temperamentally unsuited for certain things so it kind of led to i would say a slightly impulsive decision to move into the investment management field 
So I joined Wealth Advisors, which was a boutique at that point of time. Eventually, the company got acquired by IFL Private Wealth. So I spent a couple of years there, went through a huge disruption because the direct plan of the mutual funds came through, which sort of, you know, disrupted the entire institutional fixed income advisory space. So overnight, you're looking at customers who wanted to go direct, who didn't really want to work through a distributor. So that prompted a next, I would say, career change where I got into private banking at ICSA Bank. Started working with a lot of HNI families, family officers based out of South India. So you get a real ground up understanding of number one, how banking in India is actually done. So the kind of banking, you know, the perception that we have sitting outside as investors and what you experience on a day to day basis as a wealth manager and as somebody who's part of a very large private bank, who sees branch operations, who sees corporate banking operations from very close quarters. So that's a real eye opener for me. And I experienced something similar in IT sales as well. I mean, the external perception that analysts had, that fund managers had of IT services at that point of time was, I would say, a little bit of a deviation from what the view that the insiders had. So mostly employees, senior managers, promoters at that point of time. So that, in fact, forms the basis for the discussion that we're going to be having today. Because what I've experienced is this. Investors, I mean, people who are, let's say, primarily doing investing in addition to whatever they choose as a professional career. And a lot of professional investors who have never done operations in their life. So what tends to happen is we don't have a very, very well, I would say, ingrained or an in-depth view of how operations are run in some of these real wealth clear sets in India. At the same time, the corollary to that is that very few operating managers actually understanding understand investing well enough. So what tends to happen is people can give you very, very intelligent commentary about what is happening in the market, what the growth rate could be. But when it comes to, let's say, forming a nuanced view and an unbiased view in terms of competitive position, in terms of, let's say, views on valuation, what seems to be getting priced into the stock price. So generally, operating managers tend to sort of, you know, come a little bit short over there, even if they have done their MBA, they are decent investors in trade on capability. So in fact, this is one of the big disconnects that I myself struggled to, you know, sort of reconcile in the first four to five years of my career as a serious investor. So in terms of my experience, just taking that forward. So I think the bulk of my experience as an operating manager has been on the customer facing side. So with Infosys, I worked as an associate engagement manager. So I was managing a p &L upwards of 5 million USD sitting out of Bangalore at a very, very young age. I was probably, if not the youngest, one of the early, one of the youngest guys in the sales team across the entire organization. So I must have sold products across core banking, internet banking solutions, security solutions, two-factor authentication. I must have probably done the occasional Oracle database deal as well. And then from there, I moved into a industry where the kind of selling you do is totally, totally different. So you get down to selling basic financial products like mutual funds, you sell bonds, portfolio management offering, structured products, you deal with the HNI segment, emerging affluent, and then you deal with both the corporates and individuals. So I would say that this sort of experience that I have, I would say it places me in a slightly, I would say, advantageous position when it comes to doing business analysis. Because I think given the fact that I've done p management for almost 11 years with some of the best wealth creators that the country has seen. And now I'm sitting on the other side as an investor. So I find myself toggling between the investor hat and the operating manager's hat. So whenever I take a look at, let's say, a business, I do the entire research in terms of, let's say, doing the Excel sheet work. You go through the annual reports. You participate in investor commentaries. But deep down, once you actually get down to taking the decision in terms of what is your view about this business, that is where the operating perspective really, really tends to, you know, add much more, I would say, a layer of depth to the fundamental analysis that I do. So I guess that's probably would be my opening statement. So so should we just get go ahead into the meteor part of the discussion? Terms? Yeah, yeah. Kedar, it would be great to know what's the respectable level of depth to analyze a business to start with. Uh, yeah, sure, sure. So in a sense, I just want to take a couple of, you know, real life examples. So this is something that I saw around myself as an IT services employee and then somebody who was working with a bank. So what was happening was this, you know, as you know, Infosys gave a lot of ESOPs. 
a lot of IT companies, with the exception of one or two, they have created wealth for their employees through the ease of manner. So you had a situation where people were managing, let's say, fifty million dollars, hundred million dollars P&L within Infosys. They had a fair amount of ESOP grants that were kind of you know vesting every one year, two years, three years, whatever. But then I went around asking them a very simple question: Once you knew that the business was growing at thirty percent, once you saw for yourself within the internal MIA saying the business is easily able to do twenty percent, twenty-five percent, thirty percent back in those days, what prevented you from let's say accumulating more of the stock? None of them have an answer. Even though these were people who were business heads, these were people who went to the best P schools. Top their batch at an IIM, Ahmedabad, or an IIM Bangalore. I mean, keeping aside the entire insider trading sort of angle, there was always a window where, as an employee, if you believed in the organization that you work for, you could legally, ethically go and actually add more. Nobody, you know, sort of managed to put the pieces together over there. So that is one of the limitations that I saw from an operating point of view. So the other thing is, I mean, most of us would be familiar with the Satyam saga. one of the things that you will you know figure out when you have a very detailed discussion with some of the employees who were there with satyam at that point of time project level margins and the margins that were being reported by the company at the organization level there was a severe discrepancy so nobody managed to you know put the entire they, nobody managed to actually connect the dots and actually figure out saying bhaiya yahan pe ho kya raha so in that sense i guess one of the most important things to understand is what is it that investors really care about so when you are an investor when you are a retail investor or let's say even when you are an hna investor in a stock what is it that you really care about so you care about things like revenue growth you would probably be interested in what is the margin profile of the company and what how it could change going forward what will be the medium term and the long term path growth of the company what will be the free cash flow that will that the business will probably generate if you are somebody who believes in a dcf mindset what will be the capital efficiency whatever you choose to measure this roc roe or whatever it is and then you'll try and get an estimate in terms of what kind of investments does the business need to keep delivering this growth over the next 10 years so what sort of capex does the business really need to do what sort of working capital investments does it need so cash flows from an operating level how much of that actually gets converted i mean from a pat level how much of that actually gets converted into the operational cash flow how much of that gets converted into the free cash flow and then you kind of have a view on let's say the absolute valuation based on whatever methodology you choose and then you try to do a relative valuation i mean the whatever activities that investors do i would say 80% of the activity is summed up by these set of activities so once you have a view on these sort of parameters about any business it is relatively easier for you to take a medium term view long term view in terms of number 1 would you want to own the business and number 2 at what price do you want to let's say own the business and at what price do you think the business will start to look poor value now this is the investing point of view now let's say i flip the entire thing and i tell you think if you are let's say a senior manager or let's say somebody who's sitting in mid management in this company who's got pnl responsibility let's say you are given a particular region or a particular new category and if i ask you what are the things that you really care about it's a different set of parameters because over here the operating perspective actually comes in and it starts to dominate so as an operating manager what would you ideally care about you will think what is the size of the market what is my current market share what is my current competitive positioning so if the management has given me a target in terms of let's say 25% growth for the next 3 years and then you do a 20% growth for the next 5 years so what is it that i really need to focus on to grow this category or grow this business so over there you start asking yourself question saying what does my product portfolio look like which are the customer segments that i am actually selling towards what is my positioning within those particular customer segments okay what sort of pricing model do i really want to give to my customer segment where do i really want to price myself do you want to be an economy player do you want to be a premium player and all of this reflects into you know your entire marketing plan strategic plan whatever you want to call it and that is what you use to track execution on a daily basis and the final point which is very very important and i believe that is extremely underrated in the indian situation is distribution i mean i i i guess most of us have read a lot of content from investing gyan on social media in books so this is something that we have i'm guessing a lot of us would have practically seen a decent product 
with very good distribution in the long run is going to beat an excellent product with a limited with a limited distribution so how do you do distribution do you reach across to customers directly is this a category where it is amenable or is this a category where you need to go through a channel if you are going through a channel for what reason what sort of control do you want to really exert on that particular channel so these are the questions that operating managers actually care about and eventually as an employee as an employee with a company you start to ask yourself is this a tough battle or is this an easy battle because end of the day as an investor or as an employee you want to fight easy battles you don't want to be the best guy in a very very bad sector where the profit pool itself is shrinking or it is very very limited you want to be let's say even if you are the number 2 or the number 3 guy in a sector that is growing very fast that's an easy business so as an employee or as an investor we are all looking for relatively easy guys. though it is very very romantic to say that i have fought through a very tough market i have fought through a very tough industry end of the day all of us are looking for some sort of you know predictable easy sort of growth that is basic human nature it's nothing to be ashamed of so at the same time if this is what my execution is going to be you tend to ask yourself in terms of the power balance that you have so there are various power balances that are existing in an ecosystem at any point of time i mean we should all go back to the very well known quote by warren buffett so he said that behind every stock there is a business every investor needs to spend time understanding that in fact i would take that one step forward and we would say behind every business you have people you have processes you have culture and you have various relationships with stakeholders so this is where the bulk of the work needs to be done when you are trying to wear the operating manager's hat so in that sense you ask yourself as an employee with a company who has the bigger power at this point of time is my employer having more power or do i have some sort of power in my hand as an employee what is the amount of negotiating power that i have with my own boss and with my own organization in addition when i am sitting across the table to let's say deal with a business partner who is more powerful in the ecosystem who tends to get favorable terms how does it happen with respect to customers am i one of the let's say 20 commoditized vendors who's trying to sell to the same set of concentrated buying centers in which case you will not really have too much of power in your hand similarly when it comes to vendors if you are extremely dependent on let's say one single vendor and trust me this is something that would happen in the case of core banking so as somebody who is responsible for the transaction processing engine of a bank you can literally you know go and hold the management by the throat you have that sort of power kudos to some of the companies out there who keep it a fair deal who tend to treat their customers with a lot of respect but put yourself in the shoes if you are if if you are a bank and if your core banking does not work i mean there's it's real chaos anywhere and some banks have actually seen this during a core banking migration so power balance with respect to the entire ecosystem the more the power balance that you have as an employee or as a manager the easier your life is and easier growth is going to be in addition to this what sort of investments do i need to make into hiring what sort of technology systems do we really need to have what sort of processes do we really need to define how many exceptions do you really want to tackle with on a daily basis and what sort of culture do you really want at the end of the day because if you want to become a pan india player from being let's say a regional heavy player or a player who's focused on a specific category if you don't have the right culture specifically in a people business it's a very very difficult i would say a chasm to cross from being a regional player to a pan india player the best example for this is banking we have so many banks that are very very strong in their regional pockets but in the last 10 years there are very few banks that have actually gone on to build a pan india scale i mean with the exception of an indus in bank which has grown really aggressively in the past 15 years there are very few banks that have started from let's say 200 branches and have crossed that chasm to let's say 1500 branches so culture becomes very very important in certain industries last but not the least how easy is it for the employee how easy is it for you as an operating manager to actually grow in the career as the business grows because what tends to happen is in mature businesses once you hit a particular threshold employees tend to grow at a slower rate payroll expenses tend to grow only at 8% 9% whereas the, the the revenue may grow at 15% so the perspectives that you see as an operating manager if you wear that particular hat and tell yourself if i am a category manager within this particular fmcg company if i am in charge of let's say the personal the the, the personal category within let's say an hul or within a marico 
how easy is it for me to actually make a difference and take the business to the next level then you start find yourself thinking about you know all of these aspects rather than just thinking about the outcome of all of this so i think we just need to look at it this way the operating parameters are the driving force behind the numbers that we tend to see as investors so what happens in the quarterly results is an outcome of the management decisions that were taken two years ago or three years ago and how the execution has been since then so you have a lead indicators you have lag indicators so we believe that the quarterly results that you see it is at best a lag indicator is it's at best a lag indicator the real meteor part of business analysis comes in once you start thinking in terms of an operating management so i just want to take a check point over here prince and say okay does this does this make sense or or do you think i should probably slow down in terms of what i'm trying to communicate here yeah it's perfectly making sense and uh, we shall uh, go on with this uh, kedar yeah okay fair enough so i think once again the idea is to make this a very very practical session where people will have a lot of tangible takeaways so once again i want to talk about say a couple of industries so i will pick the industries that i have worked in and i'm sure that every investor who signed into this call would have evaluated it services companies at some point of time they probably hold investments over there and banking is something that everybody has either evaluated or participated in one way or the other so let's look at banking through the entire operating perspective so from an investing point of view what is it that we really care about we take a look at how strong is the liability franchise that tends to determine your cost of capital over the long term so stronger your branch network better your brand so people tend to park their surplus money with you either in a current account or in a savings account or in terms of some sort of an investment product so over a period of time you tend to get a higher share of the wallet now when it comes to let's say making on the asset side it's a question of what sort of loan portfolio does the bank really want to build do you want to focus on mortgages as a category or do you think the risk reward is very very favorable to you if you go on to the corporate banking side right now and so these are the things that we really look at as investors so lo- what is the loan growth what is the deposit growth rate what is the spread that you are making at the overall level so what is your net interest margin now what is the extent of fee income that the bank is able to generate in terms of its cross selling endeavors so this is the fee that you typically make from let's say cross selling cards cross selling mutual funds insurance and a whole bunch of things so i guess the definition of fee income is something that doesn't really have a cost of capital attached to it at least this is the way we would see it within the bank so if you have a cost of capital obviously it's a lending income if you don't have a cost of capital it is going to be this so and then end of the day we will you know start to evaluate saying what exactly is the extent of nps in the system so what is the roe what is the roa so this is what investors track on a quarterly basis now if i were to let's say look at it from the operating perspective these are the questions i would really ask myself any form of cross selling culture that you want to put in place within a bank it takes years to build it takes it literally takes years the best case study is hdfc bank best case study is hdfc bank i mean look at hdfc bank clockwork precision 20% growth yoy consistently for the past 10 years but the kind of culture that you really need to put in place to be able to deliver that sort of number at a predictable level it is not pleasant it is really not pleasant so i guess i would encourage everybody to get a sense of how cross selling actually happens at a branch level so let's say if a branch is opening at 9 o'clock you should probably figure out a way of walking into that branch at around 8:30 so around 8:30 you will see the entire branch staff sitting in the branch manager's cubicle so they call it an early morning sales huddle so that's a huddle where the branch manager tries to motivate code put use force to get people to actually deliver on their numbers so at one point of time this is how it would work the best banks they have a matrix they have a crm matrix which says this particular customer has a savings account what is his profile is he a businessman why doesn't he have his current account with us okay now that he has some amount of money sitting in savings account what products can we cross sell to this guy does he fit into the privileged banking channel does he fit into the wealth management channel or is he somebody who's got more than 1 million dollar of let's say investable surplus in which case you try and cross sell a private banking offering to him on the corporate banking side either you do transaction banking or you do lending to that particular company so there are some businesses which are very very cash heavy so 
all of these things if you look at it from an operating point of view it just comes down to this have i penetrated well enough into every single customer out there both at a corporate level and at an individual level okay now let's take a simple product category something which is the bread and butter of every single bank in india which is the home loan business home loan on the face of it it looks like a very very simple product but it takes a long time to actually build a strong fan base so on that note i would encourage all of you to go through the comments of the ceo of south indian bank who has been a career banker and spent a lot of time with icici bank so i think one of the questions asked by the analyst was sir what are our views on building a mortgage and franchise his answer was something that was very very well grounded so i'll give you the gist of what he said he said even if you go to let's say a leading bank there's a lot of home loan cases it tends to come through dsa so there are people who represent the customer or let's say a pocket of customers and say my customer needs a loan i am talking to you i am talking to an icici bank i am talking to an access bank who can give me the best turnaround on time who can give me the best commission on a high quality loan like this one so i think within the let's say certain centers if you go and the 50% of the low home loan cases actually comes through the dss and mortgage as a product is valued very very highly by the bank because number one it is secured lending number two it's a 20 year product where the customer has got absolutely no incentive to default so it is very very easy for you to know play around with the pricing figure out how much of it we want to actually book up front and how much commission do you want to pass off to the dsa now the second point to for you to build a profitable channel in terms of you know funding the best projects in the city so let's take an example of a city like a bangalore so bangalore may look at all the category a builders so you have a prestige you have a soba you have a brigade you have a whole bunch of other guys now a real estate business is hungry for capital at any point of time so if you are one of the banks who's actually funding a project it is pretty much an unwritten rule that eventually you are the person who's going to get the lion share when the project actually starts selling in the market because the bank will do an empanelment of the entire product so that you don't have to do a due diligence at the project level due diligence is done one time then you take each particular customer case now put yourself in the shoes of a tier 2 or a tier 3 bank who is not in a situation to you know go and fund a builder so the builder is not going to allow you to you know participate in the entire home loan mela that it is so building a home loan book is not really easy because why would a good builder agree to a marketing tie up when the bank is not willing to fund them in the first place so go through this i think it's the second quarter or the first quarter conference call of this financial year so this is a very 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 sensible take by a very very seasoned banker so now once again let's look at two case studies here let's look at an icici bank let's look at an hdfc bank for the longest time icici bank was clearly the darling of the market i am talking of the previous run starting from 2002 till about 2008 or even till let's say 2013 look at the stock price icici bank did really well for what reason they were the most aggressive corporate banking lender out there i mean senior rms would start a meeting with a statement to the customer saying sir we have the willingness and we have the ability to underwrite large loans if you are looking for a 100 crore loan we will do the entire thing to you we will do a syndication we will bring other banks to the table we can turn it around very very quickly so long as we are convinced about certain things and corporate banking what tends to happen is the effort is very very intensive but the payoff can be really really huge if you do it well whereas on the retail side building a granular book takes a lot of time it takes a lot of expenses so in 2002 till about let's say 2013 corporate india was very very hungry for funds look at the valuation that was being given to an icici bank i mean hdfc bank was doing well but people saw that as a retail bank but once the corporate npas actually started hitting the balance sheets then the market came to the wise conclusion saying you want to back a retail bank so that is when hdfc bank you know started trading at a very very aggressive valuation compared to icici bank icici bank stock price basically went nowhere but in the meanwhile icici bank started doing a pivot in favor of you know the retail retail banking compared to their emphasis on corporate banking but the results of that were seen only post 2018 while the focus started in 2015 So one of the questions that you would have asked yourself if you were evaluating banking at that point of time, you would just ask yourself who is given who is given more power and more respect in the system. 
till a particular point of time i guess corporate banking people they had they held all the power they could just fly in at a days notice sometimes they would book a ticket in the morning at 10 o'clock take a flight at flight at 12 o'clock to a promoter meeting at 3 o'clock in mumbai all these things were there same thing if you had spoken to the corporate banking arm in 2016 2017 they were told no we are going slow on these sectors whereas the retail banking side was the person who actually had all the power so one of the questions you really need to ask yourself when it comes to you know evaluating the credit underwriting capabilities of banks ask yourself who holds the power is it the corporate central credit team or is it the corporate banker whenever the corporate banker has a swagger generally it's the precursor of you know a system of bad loans about to hit the entire system over the next 2 to 3 years whenever the credit team becomes more powerful it's a very frustrating time for the customer facing guy because deals will not happen you will only go meet customers you will probably make a whole bunch of proposals but your central team is not going to pass that proposal so it gets very very frustrating for a whole bunch of people which is exactly why i kind of you know find myself laughing internally whenever somebody comes and tells me this can become the next hdfc bank becoming the next hdfc bank or becoming the next icsa bank is definitely not child bank so extending this logic as as a core banking salesman i was focusing morely on the southern part of the country so i was selling to banks that were based out of tamil nadu that were based out of kerala and at that point of your time you know the entire narrative in the market was some of these banks will actually go on to become pan india bank but the problem was this if you look at how those banks actually got started in the first place they started by a set of people coming together within a particular community so that community focus that sort of you know focus saying let us do something for this particular part of the country was very very strong you will see a similar flavor when you go to south canada so mangalore based you have three banks so one of them private couple of them are like uh, you know psos so over there as well but then the point is this you attend any of their senior management meetings the management meeting happens in the local language so just put yourself in the shoes of a of a north indian branch manager who is based out of bangalore or based out of mumbai you will always feel like an outsider so in, in banking which is primarily a risk management cross selling and cross selling always comes down to the culture and it comes down to people if you don't make people included if if people get the feeling that eventually i'll have to report into somebody who's closer to the head office it's very tough for you to attract and to retain the right sort of talent so that answers the earlier observation that i made there are very very few banks which are regional banks that have made the cut to actually become a pan india bank so which is why paying a high valuation for a bank which is growing very well right now it is very very difficult for a bank to actually grow outside of the core market at the same time one of the other questions that i would think of as an operating manager is this does this bank really have a decent wealth management practice because wealth management is slightly elitist it's very very contemporary and it's very very cosmopolitan culture you will not see a vibrant wealth management practice in a lot of regional banks because they don't have that culture in the first place so a case study over here is this sbi for the longest time didn't really care about wealth management but they made a lot of senior management hires in 2013 they actually took them on a totally different employment model because the sbi salaries would not have been palatable to these set of people so they brought in people on a totally different model as a contractual employee whose contract is you know sort of renewed every 3 years 5 years once that focus came in you start seeing the higher inflows to the sbi mutual fund as well because it's a distribution game it's a relationship management yeah so any bank that can actually scale up to let's say even 20000 crores 25000 crores in wealth management chances are they will do very well at cross selling because it's a culture part so this is a very good proxy so one of the other things that i see where you know i would say there's a lot of superficial thinking is this i have seen a lot of social media posts so you take an hdfc bank or an icici bank you start calculating what is the per branch revenue per branch profit and then you compare it with something like an idfc first bank or a south indian bank i mean it's sort of fair comparison even within an icici bank take the flagship branches in a particular city like bangalore take the top five branches they would be responsible for i'm guessing maybe 40% of the revenue that the entire region actually does you set up a branch it takes you 3 years to actually break even because your operating expenses it starts from day one 
once you start a branch you need a basic minimum level of staff you need a privileged banker you need a branch manager you need a 24 bar 7 security guard and you need somebody who can do you know basic corporate transactions like remittance processing and all of that so for you to generate enough revenue to be able to cover the cost of all these people so it's a very very clear curve it works like a saas business three years you will not make money fourth year you make you become profitable but once you become profitable every incremental revenue that you do within the branch flows disproportionately to the bottom line so the right way of evaluating the productivity of branches within any bank is to make a distinction between the branches that are more than 5 years old and branches that are less than 5 years old that will tell you how well the operating setup is actually working so once again when you decide to open a branch opening branches there's a whole amount of science towards it where do you want to open a branch do you want a branch in the main road where your where your this thing is going to be let's say operating expenses are going to be slightly higher what catchment areas are you really targeting because salary tie ups happen at a corporate level whereas when it comes to let's say independent consumption decisions that happens at an individual level so what is the catchment area that you are really targeting how do you execute local level marketing and awareness building i mean i just go back 10 years in time so a psu bank they would actually have a couple of branch members knocking on every single door and telling them our branch has opened sir please walk in whatever you want this sort of local level marketing has to be done by every single you know catchment area out there i mean even if you look at the qsr business what tends to happen is a jubilant food works will probably dominos will have some sort of a marketing or an advertising budget at the national level but every single store will have to do a whole amount of local level marketing so how do you execute that so these are so many of these operative perspectives that you actually need to build and i guess if not if not all some of them become very very interesting inputs to your valuation so if you are buying a regional bank right now who has less than let's say let's say less than 25 or 35% 30% of their branches outside of the core area if you get a sense of the culture that will give you an answer as to saying will this bank really scale over the next 10 years or are you just playing it for a valuation thing so there's a lot of inputs that you can actually get through from here the other example i would probably want to look at is look at it service i mean it services is a fantastic business for obvious reasons but the thing is this ask yourself what is the differentiation that is there across all the players i mean infosys and tcs just to take an example in terms of it is there any great difference in terms of pricing is there any great difference in terms of the capabilities i mean both can do sap both can do digital offerings both can you know get the ground running in terms of a saas implementation both can do infrastructure management services both can do some amount of pseudo consulting they even hire from one another people spend 10 years in infosys then he goes to tcs then he goes to cts and all of that even at the ceo level you have people poaching from one another so the extent of differentiation in it services if you look at it from the investors hat is actually not it's actually not very high i mean it's easy to say that tcs typically has a higher proportion of revenue coming in from fixed price contracts infosys traditionally wanted to do only t and m infosys gave consulting offerings a real serious sort of an effort at some point of time which unfortunately did not succeed to the extent that they really wanted to so end of the day what is growth really a function of so this has been my understanding after spending some amount of time in it sales it just comes down to the quality of the business development team how motivated are they so one of the it stocks that we held in the portfolio from 2019 till say the beginning of 2022 was lnt infotech reasons we ran a screener we saw that lnt infotech was able to do 15% constant currency growth whereas the other guys were actually struggling and it was not because this is a mid cap it company and the everything else is a large company even within mid cap it pack lnt infotech for some reason was able to do market leading growth so then i found myself asking why so then i went into linkedin and sort of you know figured out who are the salesmen a lot of them were familiar names because when i started my career as an it salesman i was reporting into i mean the head of the business was a, was the same person who eventually became the ceo of lnt infotech so when he shifted from infosys to lnt infotech some of the best salesmen the sales team that he had personally built over 10 years 
he took a lot of people from Infosys to over there, and then they started delivering. They started acquiring all these market relationships. And as you know, in B two B sales, what happens is onboarding a customer takes time. You will start with a four hundred k, five hundred k USD sort of an engagement, but if you do a good job, in three four years that will become a four million five million dollar sort of an amount. So. IT services through the lens of an investor, it's very very difficult to you know figure out who the next leader is going to be. But the moment you start thinking mostly in terms of you know an operating manager, you start asking yourself, which is the company that's actually investing into growth? And to take an example, once again from 2008 2009, the way CTS that is Cognizant reacted from the way compared to the way the Indian IT services reacted was totally different. Indian IT services straight away went into a cost-cutting mode. They actually called back people who were doing pseudo sales role. They forced them to come back to India. They did cost-cutting. What CTS did was they actually sent more people on site. They told people it's going to be very frustrating for the next eighteen months, but we just want you to go and meet every single buying center, meet every single buying center within the customer organization, build those relationships, so that once the uptick comes. The revenue flow is going to be much better, and that is exactly what happened. Whereas some of our India-based, I would say, IT services companies were actually caught napping when the market turned very, very quickly in 2020. So all these operating decisions that get taken. So once you are able to figure out some sort of a framework based on which you will synthesize all of these inputs, I think valuation becomes a much more comprehensive and a meaningful exercise. Rather than you know just taking a look at the historical base rate, saying "chalo, IT is going to do five percent, six percent constant currency, rupee is going to depreciate by two percent, three percent every year," so that gives you a revenue growth of let's say seven percent, eight percent. Who per se you will say, "Okay, fine." So profit rate is probably going to be slightly higher because salaries may not grow at that same level because salaries didn't grow for a long time in IT, right? Then you will say that the company is going to do a buyback, and then you say, "mota mota," it's going to be eleven percent, twelve percent. So that is what you actually price into your model, okay? And then the last one and a half years, you saw a tremendous amount of deal traction in the IT services. But then look at the stock prices today. There are reasons for why that is happening. As an investor, the only comment that I can make, if I wear the investor hat, is this: ten-year long-term PE multiple of TCS is closer to twenty-four, twenty-five. Today it trades at twenty-eight, twenty-nine. So the correction may still have some legs. But the moment I start thinking as an operating manager, you will start thinking, okay, they are sitting on a TCV of close to let's say eight, eight and a half billion USD, whatever that is. How much of that is actually going to get executed over the next, say, one year? Is there going to be any sort of a delay over there? If the management is really bullish about the business, the way they give comment B, why aren't they hiring people? I mean, this is the lowest net hiring numbers I have seen for IT services in a long, long time. I have been tracking this for a long time. So what does that tell you about that? So you start thinking more in terms of this. So it offers much more depth to you in terms of you know doing the analysis rather than just you know basing it purely on numbers. So yeah, these are the couple of examples that I wanted to you know take in. So just taking a checkpoint to you know to see if if there are any aspects yeah. that you would you know want me to reiterate, any questions that you would want to take at this point of time. Yeah, yeah, we we have few questions with us. So, Vineet, uh, you go first, and then we move on to Shashank. Yeah. Hi, Kedar, how are you? Hi, hi, good to talk to you. Uh, good, good. So, Kedar, this is regarding uh, the banking aspect which you touched on uh, um, in the discussion right now. Uh, ICICI actually recently changed their incentive policy, uh, probably I think twelve months back. So. what is your take on it how will it impact uh, the business going forward because what i remember uh, in past i icici used to be a very aggressive bank while giving the incentives i have many people uh, on the operating level of icici at different corporate and retail also and almost everyone is saying that uh, target doesn't matter now so we will get the incentive based on bank's profitability so don't you think it's a uh, you know uh, it's a dampener for uh, getting uh, more aggressive ha huh, so i'll just set the context for that when it so i think there's been a cultural shift in the bank as well over the past 5 years i think what happened till 2018 was this so 
so i i i think there was some sort of a disconnect between the people on the ground so what was really happening was the corporate team started to look at themselves as you know the people who were running the entire bank whereas with the new ceo taking over i think the whole of pkc head office has been told that you are a business enabler you are not a decision maker so that was the first phase of you know cultural reforms that the new ceo did the second aspect which you bring up is actually a very very interesting one which can turn out to be a double edged sword because we have experienced something similar in it services as well so you have let's say a target for the individual you have a target for the particular line of business and then there is this function of how the overall company does so right now you are absolutely right the incentive structure has actually been changed where people are being told it is not really a great outcome for the business if you do 120% of your target achievement but the team does not achieve the 100% at a regional level at a product level have you achieved the target and eventually it's a question of that i mean the this 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 multiple ways of looking at it managements typically tend to do this as an incentive structure to enable people to you know think more as a team rather than thinking in terms of individual goals but then this tends to you know foster a very democratic sort of a thought process over the next few years so that is something that i would definitely keep my eyes out for so i think you hit the nail on the head it can be a double edged sword so we'll have to see how the situation goes great thanks So Sashank, uh, you go next. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, thanks for the wonderful session, Kedar. I think it was really, really, you know, some very deep level insights. Uh, my question to you is, like, you know, we are, you know, investors, and of course, we are dealing with, like, you know, every stock behind every stock, as you said, you know, there is a business. So where do we, where do we, like, you know, draw the line, like, you know, because. you were talking about power dynamics power dynamics between like you know uh, between the company and the customers the pricing points and all but i'm sure i mean there must also be a power dynamic between an entrepreneur and an investor so so where do you think as an investor we are in a like you know what are our strengths when it comes to holding a stock and making the money out of it because entrepreneur and big institutional investors they are, they are you know they have the size issue and they are like you know uh obliged to think on the entrepreneurial term so where, where do you like you know how do you generate alpha as an investor when you know make ensuring the power dynamics is in your favor yeah so very interesting question shashank so i guess there's a lot of you know i mean this can be like a whole whole one hour discussion by itself so i'll give you two answers so first is i think not every sector is the same especially i mean let's think of the point of origin being you as an investor now you may understand it services far better than let's say bank or vice versa whereas i may understand let's say pharma or a consumer business far better than anything else so i don't think at any point of time the investor will have a better sense of what is happening on the operation side where we have an edge is in terms of you know understanding what possibilities are there and purely in terms of figuring out what exactly is getting priced into the business right now so i would put it this way if you think you are you have a high amount of competence in a few sectors or in a few businesses that is where you need to focus on alpha generation otherwise i think the practical answer to focus on is to just see which are the sectors where you have relative strength right now so that is effectively the investors who are voting with their money and then you play the allocation game but if you want to play this medium term long term game i think deep insights are very much needed and these insights number 1 need to be tangible they need to be reliable and number th- and number 2 these insights have to be something that can actually give you good inputs to your valuation model i mean i can think of a situation where i understand let's say wealth management amc better than probably anybody else out there but does that give me an edge when it comes to valuing the business if it doesn't i have a lot of insights but they are not worth acting upon as an investor so there's multiple facets to this so based on i would say your 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 to, to use a very sort of you know a, a, a cliche term so a circle of competence so if you have the circle of competence in certain sectors 
over there you can actually focus on alpha alpha generation otherwise i guess most of the time we are only doing the beta extraction here you just have to be in the right sectors and generally investors voting with their with their money when you have smart money institutional money taking positions in certain stocks so just write the entire trend over there so i don't know if that answers your question but it's a very very deep question to be yeah so de- it- def- definitely does actually because you know the thing is that i i, I personally see it as like you know price strength to return ratio and business insights to return ratio and you know people with a smaller capital generally like and especially the new investors who do not have this level of insights are better off using the you know the price strength to return ratio so yeah i think you touched on that so yeah like you know relative strength is uh, one of the one of the areas one can you know use where we don't have the circle of competence yeah thank you so much thanks for sharing so hiral uh, you can unmute and ask a question hey uh, this is regarding uh, you know uh, it sector uh, i think we are reading too much into tcs headcount numbers uh, i believe you know over last one year attrition was so high that you know if a company wanted to hire one person for a job they had to roll out three to four offers you know and hope that one of them will join so from there you know uh, in last 3 three odd months uh, job market has cooled off a bit and that has resulted in oversupply in certain skills and probably that is the reason you know we did not see growth in tcs headcount numbers but that doesn't mean you know uh, from business standpoint that is any major impact so far so the just you know my two cents on it sector that's possible here you know you know it's 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 i agree it's too early to sort of you know extrapolate this but i guess this is the second quarter where something like this is happening so to be fair i think there's actually something else that is there at the back of my mind when it comes to the it sector so look at all the large deals that have been signed in the past one and a half years i mean you signed a total outsourcing deal worth 8 billion usd in europe where you are taking over whole parts of the client's it infrastructure you are acquiring companies all together along with the existing i would say employment policies existing work culture policies and all of that and in addition to that you are doing employee rebadging as well so this has been my experience so if you let's say come up with a margin sheet put the exact same set of parameters for a customer who's based in the us and then you do it for a customer who's based in let's say countries like switzerland germany france where the labor laws are very very strong and the margin profile is actually poor so my overall reading has been this and i've been pretty vocal on this on social media over the past say one year these large deals will have a lot of you know i would say customized terms and conditions which investors will never get to know i mean if i have signed up to keep employees on the books for the next 5 years okay if i have signed up saying they are not going to sign into conference calls early in the morning or late in the day it's a pretty huge liability when the growth actually doesn't do this so i have my doubts about the margin profile number one of that and number two what could happen is this i mean if a customer has given you a commitment of let's say an 8 billion dollars of revenue over let's say the next 10 years chances are that 10 years may become actually 12 years or 13 years so i think it's a wait and watch mode it's just the second quarter where you know hiring is actually much lower compared to what it should have ideally been but if this trend picks up pace i would definitely read too much into that but for that i think just sitting and you know watching it's just one of the many factors to be on so your point i think is well taken it's very important that we don't jump to conclusion but if three four indicators point in the same direction so i am a big fan of you know taking managed word management words with a pinch of salt because i i like to invest based on skin in the game and what people actually execute on the ground so not coming to any conclusions but i think it's a very interesting phase that we have coming up right now i hope things fall into place because i think it's a very very good business and india as a consumption economy needs the it services sector to do really well we want people to do well we want people to get a good salary hike so that they can consume they can buy automobiles they can send real estate prices higher so i hope the sector turns around very soon but i would probably wait and watch for the next one or two quarters before coming to any sort of firm
i would put it that all right so we take uh, janak question uh, kedar and then we can continue with the uh, i mean your presentation so janak you can unmute and ask a question hi kedar good evening and uh, thank you for taking my uh, question prince and kedar uh, so uh, kedar my query is around uh, mergers and acquisitions and uh, the primary query that i have around this uh, subject is how as investors who are students of stock market uh, go about evaluating such a situation be it case in example of hdfc hdfc bank merger or lti mindtree merger or a very recent acquisition say for instance by ltts where the ma despite management coming on the media channel and saying that this in the medium term this deal is going to be margin and eps accretive will add capabilities uh, the stock markets uh, gives a knee jerk reaction okay and these are some of, some of them are maybe good companies may not be good companies but uh, the it, it is observed that market uh, goes into a negative or a sense of pessimism around it so how do we assess such a scenario and how do we go about uh, investing or playing this out Mm -hmm. so i guess once again the context in which a particular m&d activity is done becomes very very important i mean generally if we just study history and look at the base rates m&a that happens when a sector is doing very very well actually tends to turn out to be a bad decision most of so just go back to all the acquisitions that our domestic pharma companies did in the 2030 to 2016 i mean you had some of these pharma companies picking picking people who had hardly spent 4 5 years after the school doing consulting they were put in charge of m&a so they were taking decisions on acquiring companies for 100 million 200 million so in times of exuberance where the management is focused too much on growth compared to risk management most m&as turn out to be failures but if it's an m&a that is happening when the market is not very very buoyant or let's say if it's an m&a that is happening when the sector or the particular market is not doing well the chances of success actually tends to be much higher but overall m&a is very very tricky it's very very tricky so i would determine it purely based on the context unless the m&a strategy is like very very clear i mean you have just look at the sort of acquisitions that for example a suprajit engineering has done just to take an example it's very clear cost leadership in a particular component can i move the bulk of the production to india can i hold on to the customers in spite of that they have run into a whole bunch of integration issues mostly on the europe side so context most important second thing is within 5 minutes of reading the management note i would look for clarity why exactly are they doing this acquisition why this company how does it really fit in with their existing scheme of things the higher the gulf between where the company is right now and what the acquiring company is doing so i think lti mind tree the risk is actually not very high if you look at it that way even hdfc bank hdfc limited technically speaking the risk is not very high but if somebody says i'm going to go and acquire a company that is based out of let's say us uk or europe right now the risk could be definitely much more higher so i guess 80% should be driven by the context of what's happening in the market right now and are we in times of exuberance or are we in times of you know pessimism right because the market reaction is a function of it at least in the short got it got it gives a good fairly starting point to understand uh, what capabilities is the the acquire or the merging company bringing to the table i think that does answer uh, or gives a good starting point at least thanks kedar absolutely so just to add to one more point over there this this acquisition that hcl did when they bought over this whole i think a product suite from ibm that's a risky acquisition risky not in terms of you know balance sheet risk but risky in terms of selling a product is totally different the way you approach a customer the way you hold a customer i mean the way you hold a discussion with the customer is like totally different your your sales cycle is very very long the evaluation is much more thorough in the case of a product compared to services so that i would say is still has a some amount of medium risk whereas lti mindy should be fairly simple because there's not too many points of difference between what these two organizations actually do completely agreed on the hcl bit that division is in fact turning out to be a challenge but any comments on lttts uh, acquisition of hws recently did you have a chance or would you like to oh, comment i mean you are referring to the one which you know lnt the parent is rebadging to lttts correct is that the one you are referring to uh, yeah so the lttts larsen tubro technology services buying out uh, one of the parent entities by the name of uh, i think smart world and communications very fairly recent 2 3 days ago 
Ah, yeah. So over there, I haven't really gotten to the nitty gritties of that yet. So yeah, man, I would probably refrain from commenting on that unless I really spend time on that. Got it, Kedar. Appreciate it. Thank you for your comments and experience. Uh, so, Kedar, we also have Gurjot. Uh, so, Gurjot, you can unmute and ask. Hi, Kedar. How are you doing? Doing fine, Gurjot. How are you? All good, man. Thanks for the wonderful insights on both the banking and the IT sectors. So, I just wanted to touch a little bit about banking. And uh, I think Vineet brought about the point on the change in the incentive plan. So as an ex-ICICI bank wealth manager, just thought of sharing my experience, right? And how that might have motivated me to continue with ICICI bank. So I think you talked about, right, that every morning in the banking branches, there is a sales huddle, right, at 39, 9 a.m. And I clearly re- remember that every week, every two, three days, there would be like a new target, a new sort of thing that we would be chasing as wealth managers. So a new new NFO would be launched. So that would be your target for the next three days. Get as many uh, subscriptions as possible for this new fund offer. Then there would be a new uh, ULIP or a new fixed maturity plan uh, by ICIC Prudential. So next few days, you're just trying to get as many uh, insurance policies as possible. And I just felt that whole structure uh, is completely misaligned with the customer needs, right? Because you could be meeting a 65, 70-year-old person, uh, an HNI client, but who doesn't need an insurance policy? But that's your target for the next few days. So I just feel that, and that was one of the primary reasons, right, why I left job and now I'm working in IT, that uh, your, your, your bank's targets are just not aligned with what your customer needs are. And that's where a lot of the mis-selling used to happen as well. And so if there is no more, uh, your incentives are not aligned with your personal targets, I think as an employee, uh, you can probably serve your customers a lot better. But then, as you said, I think that's a double-edged sword. You could also have some sort of employees who uh, are too laid back and then uh, do not push the bank's uh, revenue as well in that sense. So it's a double-edged sword, but I actually prefer the new policy. That's my thought on that. And I had a question to you specifically around the expansion. Um, Mm -hmm. So uh, you talked about, right, how uh, banks are still expanding into uh, multiple areas all all across India, right? Uh, So what is your feeling about, given that how technology has made banking so simplified, people don't really go to bank branches for most transactions these days, even loan gets issued and closed without ever visiting a bank branch. So so what's your sort of uh, thing on... uh, how much do banks really need to expand into newer geographies, newer areas? Uh, and and, and h- how would that compare with the previous 15, 20 years? Do you really s- still see banks, banking really need to expand with physical branches in the next 20 years as well? Yeah, so I guess the nature of banking has been obviously changing and right now. So I think there's a there's a definite asymmetry when it comes to retail investors consuming banking services. So if you are looking for a loan, generally people don't care too much about it, right? I mean, you would you would take a loan from an ICICI bank or even from a very very weak bank out there because end of the day the bank has more at risk than you do. But when it comes to let's say giving them your surplus funds, if you are parking money into FD, if you are parking into SA. I guess it's a combination of both the things that will continue to work because I think one of the things that we take for granted in urban India is this. I mean, UPI, payment, transaction, gateway, everything obviously has penetrated very deep into the hinterlands of the country. But India, even today, is a very, very high-touch market. Things are changing, no doubt. It's a very, very high-touch market. So people tend to get a lot of comfort from, you know, seeing physical branch infrastructure. So even in Bangalore, if you go to, let's say, some of these more older areas, so you go to an area like, let's say, uh, I mean, it, it may not be a very valid thing to a lot of people on this call if you don't understand the geography, but go to some of these older areas like the Basman Guri. A lot of people still bank. They like to go have a cup of chai with the branch manager. And even today, that is primarily how the EPSU bank are. Because technology-wise, in terms of you know cross-selling, they're actually nowhere, but even their book is growing. So I think... That is where the idea of segmentation actually comes from. So if you want to be a cosmopolitan bank, if you want to be largely urban-centric, and if you want to be, let's say, if your expansion is going to be more over here, you actually don't need so many branches. But then 
as you are driving by you see the branch of an idfc first bank you see an hdfc bus bank it becomes a marketing endeavor by itself so just to give an example from a totally different industry look at how relaxo footwear looks at their ebo for it they make less than 10% of revenue from their own company owned ebo stores but they look at the ebo as a direct channel where the company is directly in touch with the customer so the sort of insights you get saying what products are actually flying off what exactly is the customer looking for so this is the same reason why there's a lot of brands that take up retail space in the airports i mean at a store level they don't make any money but they see it as an advertising endeavor so a lot of perspectives to consider there i think broadly speaking what you're saying is right over a period of time i think bank will will become more and more digital but the relationship element in banking will probably continue at the bottom end of the market and at the top end of the market it's a very interesting dichotomy got it thanks a lot uh, and yeah i love your take on that thanks Thanks. Yeah, Janak, you can quickly go on, and Ravi also yeah. after Janak. So, so I raised my hand because I had a follow-up question to this because the, of the discussion that was going around. So, Kedar, just squeezing in quickly. So, where do you see in the entire gamut of the digital banking and the experience that you shared? Where do you see the new banks uh, fitting in? What uh, differentiation can they bring to the table, or are they just a passing fad, or you see more and more? Uh, traditional banks uh, adopting uh, digital tan- uh, channels like new bank what, uh, what are your thoughts on same yeah so i guess new banks i guess primarily they are mostly about the technological reach so new bank tie up would typically make sense to a bank which is in a heavy customer acquisition mode i mean i don't think i don't see why an icici bank or an hdfc bank would actually need a new bank in the first place but if you are a dcb bank if you are let's say a south indian bank if you are a, if you even if you are an idfc first bank where people are saying okay fine i am doing branch rollouts okay i need to grow my book both on the liability side or on this side the more interesting aspect would be to actually see what skin in the game does the neo bank actually have so if he is just you know passing through liability products the different thing but if the underwriting is being done to them so what would happen is typically the bank would say fine we bring in 90% of the capital you have to bring in 10% of the capital as well so that is where the skin in the game actually comes in but neo banking that way i guess it's a very interesting idea but in the long term i think the viability is yet to be proven to put it very very bluntly got it kedar uh, thanks thanks for that yeah ravi uh, you can go next yeah hi prince hi kedar actually i don't have any question i just joined i was uh, listening that someone is asking a question on the branches so what uh, changes we are seeing now is bank is adding branches even the private large banks but the size of the branch is getting very small so it helps in terms of uh, some specific services to the client say say if you if you don't have a branch in a dense pocket in bombay in some residential society you put a put up a very small branch uh, what helps in getting some accounts there then you will have one or two guys for insurance and the wealth guys so the branch size but expense helps to have uh in the roots area so that will become very small but that is how most of the private banks are saying it that uh, earlier if they were having 10 to 12 average employees they will work with 5 6 employees with a 500 to 1000 square feet branch size so the opex cost would be much much lower compared to what we have seen now yeah so yeah I, i just want to check am i still audible guys yeah yeah yeah, yeah you were audible oh, okay thanks i just okay so just to answer your question so i think this store front size getting lower is something that we are noticing across a couple of other industries as well because what's happening is this i think what has core banking actually done for the banks it has converted every single service manager into a revenue center today if i had to go and sell core banking this would be my single line to every single banker out there so what happens is when the share of digital transaction tends to go higher what happens is people who are very happy to you know use plain vanilla banking services for transaction processing they will very happily do that online so then what happens is the bandwidth of the people that are deposited as the branch banking staff they are under more and more pressure to actually generate revenue so what happens is eventually you will see most of them doing cross selling so 
they incrementally they will spend lesser and lesser time doing transaction banking and more time actually doing selling which is probably what has been happening in indian banking for the past i would say 15 20 years ever since core banking has been actually took off so i agree i think you don't need too much of that so operationally i guess i guess there's a big lever for a bank going forward it's a very very big lever so what we will see is we will see technology costs rising up in unison while the employee costs are probably coming up i think that's one theme to really watch out for so clearly it is something that will benefit banks who are using technology far very very well all right so kedar before yeah yeah can i slip one question to kedar uh, since we were talking about bank how do you see that uh, kotak kasa is not increasing for some time i guess that's uh, to do something with they are uh, reducing the uh, saving bank rate account saving uh, saving rate account uh, the kasa which used to be some 60 plus is about 55 so that is one point how do you see uh, that going forward And the other thing is, say, last six months, all of the bank, be it private or PSU, uh, they uh, they saw tremendous growth in terms of advances. Some of it is to do with inflation and those things, economy reopening. Uh, how do you see that the PSU bank always used to have a underutilization? That they used to have uh, their credit advance ratio was. Uh, Too low for them, and they used to have this have a source of liquidity which was parked in the government securities. How do you think that they have? Do they have a very long runway of one year, two year, right? Where they can utilize that deposit, or or it can come uh, to a stage where they would also need to increase uh, deposit, and that growth which they are enjoying for some time might halt quickly. yeah so i guess overall it's very useful to look at the credit growth numbers in india over the past 7 years 8 years i think credit growth was very very anemic hardly clocking 10% 11% for almost 4 years 5 years so post covid what's what's happened is i think there were two or three things that were happening simultaneously so number one what happened was the yields that you were getting on the fixed income side were much lower compared to the deposit rates so i remember i think this is something that i been writing about in my blog starting from the beginning of 2021 good chunk of my fixed income actually went into bank deposits but today if you see i am taking money out of fds and actually putting into a liquid fund because the cross yt over the liquid fund is actually much higher than the fds today so i guess what happens is as a banker i want to keep tracking my assets and liabilities there's no point in me raising casa or deposits and jacking up my cost of fund and then a whole bunch of that money is actually going and sitting in the investment book so i am buying government securities i am buying a whole bunch of things i am not doing too much of lending whereas this year i think is probably a bit of a transition year where the credit growth at the industry level is finally hitting the 15% mark whereas the deposit growth rate is probably 9% 10% so i think it's a transition year eventually i guess what's going to happen is over the next one year lending rates are anyway going higher but the deposit rates will once again start increasing i think it's an easier thing to do for a bank a good bank can get access to deposits at best you will end up paying market rates so as and when they get the feeling that my credit to deposit ratio is starting to get past a particular threshold we will definitely see the deposit rates going up in the bank system and the other factor as i said is obviously the spread between a liquid fund and an fd so that's one more interesting data point so max i think it's a transition year i wouldn't read too much into it right now. maybe wait for 6 to 12 months i think things will pretty much come sure sure thanks Thank, thanks ravi so kedar we can continue uh, with the uh, presentation thing and uh, then uh, we have second round of questions after that when you complete okay sure i guess from here i will just maybe quickly cover some five six perspectives so these are generic questions i think that all of us kind of ask ourselves within the ambit of fundamental analysis so for example one of the first things that you ask yourself is does the business really have pricing power so what is the operating manager proxy to this so i ask myself this question if you are a b2b business how are your salesmen being treated by the customers are they treated with respect or are they treated by let's say something as a necessary evil that straight away tells you saying are you just another cog in the wheel or are you a real critical vendor so over here let me give you a very very personal sort of an example 
so as a as somebody who was representing the largest core banking it vendor in the country i think we had something like 70% market share at that point of time so as part of all of this core banking tenders you would have something known as a pre bid meeting so that is where all the vendors would come to the table meet the it team of the bank understand the rfp that has been released and all of that so this was a pre bid meeting at a bangalore based bank for their regional rural banking so the branch management started with their intro then they said let's go around the room and you know quickly get a round of introduction so just tell me your name the organization you are representing and your designation so i went a little bit late to the pre bid meeting so i was actually sitting in the last or probably the last person to be called there so i was the last guy to introduce myself so i said my name i am representing this core banking vendor and this is my designation the gm of the bank who is a 57 year old guy who is probably old enough to be my father he said sir why are you sitting in the last row please come to the front look at this so that tells you how powerful the vendor is in the entire system so always ask yourself if you get around to doing a scuttle but if you talk to a salesman ask him does he get treated with respect or is he just an order taker that will tell you in terms of the p2p business now let us say in the context of fmcg let's go to a totally different model right here so one of the interesting things is this behemoths have a much easier time doing category expansion compared to let's say a new business that has a far superior product so when a Pepsi wants to let's say launch a new flavor of kurkure or whatever it is they end up getting shelf space whereas a new guy like i don't know it's not the right example but i'm just taking a name let's say a pratap snacks decides that he wants to get into supermarket stores he'll have a very very tough time getting there so why is it that the behemoth has a easier time launching new products and their products tend to get launched at a higher frequency and their success rate is actually much higher so it's all about shelf space right so then the question is you have to ask yourself what is the total value of the relationship total value of the relationship of a pepsi or an itc with respect to a supermarket chain is going to be insanely high compared to a guy who's selling only soap or let's say only something else so this is actually the biggest moat so when people say distribution this is what distribution actually brings to the table so that's very clear other question i would ask myself is pricing power or let's say in terms of aggressiveness how do the company salesman actually spend the bulk of their time are they order takers who are just sitting and doing customer service are they just sitting and are they content managing existing relationships or are they actually spending a lot of time in the field trying to win new business this is the best lead indicator for revenue growth for any company and if you do a comprehensive job over here you can actually get it right 2 to 3 years before the market actually starts to price something else so does the business have pricing power tends to sound you know slightly theoretical but these are the various perspectives that i would consider if i am looking at it from the operating point of view second perspective to consider is you always ask yourself as an investor right can this business deliver market leading growth from here so once again very interesting question first thing what we need to do is we need to understand what is the base rate of growth within that particular sector then we need to understand will this particular business is it can it do market leading growth so i think the best example once again i think one of the better examples is once again go back to the it services example so lti had the most best motivated sales team so they had people who were handling 50 million dollar engagements in infosys the same guy comes here he opens up the same account through lti starts with a 500k engagement in 2 3 years he scales that to a 5 million dollar sort of revenue so in it it just comes down to you know doing this now let's take a look at a couple of other let's say i would say industries as well so look at wealth management what do you what does it take to actually grow in wealth management as a as as a business you need to hire strong wealth managers who come with an income pet book you can hire people give them a long run but it it it's a long gestation business for you to even get to something like a 300 400 3 year sort of a book it takes you 10 years on an average so ifl wealth this is something that they did very very well initially their entire pitch as a business to wealth managers was simple you are currently sitting as the head of let's say a particular region in a bank in a bank 50% of your time goes in compliance you are supposed to do kyc you are supposed to do remittances you are supposed to do insurance and as gurjot said there's a whole lot of things that 
are not really a priority to you but are a priority to your employer so iifl went and said you are an investments guy why are you cross selling insurance why are you doing remittances we just want you to move along with your set of customers to our entity we will give you a platform please focus only on investments we will give you access to very good i would say communities we will give you a premium golfing membership go spend 10% of your time at clubs go further work on your this thing so somebody who, who was spending 12 hours logging away at a bank and spending hardly 6 hours doing investment management suddenly is saying i can spend 10 hours doing investment management i spent 5 hours servicing existing customers i think about how i really want to grow my franchise manager so in wealth management it comes down to hiring the right set of people and within wealth management the interesting part is this if you are a wealth manager with a bank the customer at the end of the day cares more about the bank than about you because banks tend to have a high amount of switching cost his current account is there his savings account is there his loan is there so poaching such a customer from a bank to an nbfc is not going to be easy so which is why in nbfc and in pure play wealth management the rm tends to you know control the equation rather than the employer which is once again a double edged sword because if you can attract such people such people can always leave you and maybe dent your book as well so can the business really deliver market trading growth from here so then you start thinking in terms of category expansion so this is the second perspective that you consider another perspective i think is very interesting to consider is it's always a good exercise to actually see the split of market development expenses so when i say market development what do i mean what is the split across advertising and below the line marketing activities so what kind of discounts are you giving what sort of margins are you really giving to your distribution channel to your retailers and how much time i mean how much money are you spending on advertising so that tells you straight away is this a push product or is this going to be a pull product so let's think in terms of let's say a few categories so if you are an fmcg guy i don't really have any influencer because i have a direct connect with the customer either directly in the d2c model or i go i connect with the customer through a particular channel so over there i just pay the distributor a basic minimum margin power balance is obviously in my hands it's very clear but when it comes to let's say products like let's say plywood products like tiles products like even mdf the end customer actually is not the key decision maker because you have this entire influencer ecosystem so you have the fabricators you have carpenters so end of the day the carpenter the the real estate construction guy they are the ones who can actually sway the decision from one brand in favor of another so in that case what brands typically tend to do is you do some amount of advertising spending but the amount of spending that you do on the channel tends to be much higher compared to this so once again that's a double edged sword because what happens is once you incentivize the channel and once you get influencer on to your side there is some element of switching cost that is already there whereas in the case of an fmcg you don't have any switching cost i can buy a pepsi ka lace today i can buy an itc ka bingo tomorrow there is nothing which the company can actually do so this split of market development expenses even if you look at it within say financialization is very interesting do this exercise for say asset management companies do this exercise for life insurance companies i mean pick up any quarterly result of let's say an hdfc life or an icic pro life they declare it very clearly with an operating expenses what is the advertising and sales promotion and then they will say market development expenses yet market development expenses are actually insanely high i think hdfc life spends more than i think 700 800 crores doing market development which means what signing up agents making their lives easy giving them a technology platform giving them better incentives and all of that so that kind of tells you when you get down to let's say understanding the competitive position of a business one of the things you will try to do is how is this business better placed compared to any of their competitors within that space so look at it as oem and channel there is a power balance equation that exists between the oem and the channel which tends to you know sometimes it sways sometimes it is heavily skewed onto one particular side so as a player who's an oem i am not only competing with the other oems out there i am also aware of the power balance that is there between me and the distribution channel so this is one of the very interesting insights that actually you can do when you do this exercise across it 
So market development expenses, how much is the ASP that is advertising and sales promotion and how much is the BTL. So another perspective you can think of is TK. Let's once again take up a slightly cliched sort of an example. So does this business really have a moat? And is it a moat that is getting stronger or is it a moat that is going to really endure? So once again, when you want to understand why a particular player has a dominant market share in that business, it is very, very interesting to, and it's very important to understand the context in which that market leadership has been obtained. So this is what I always keep asking myself. Would Astral Polytechnic, would Ashirwad pipes have grown so large in the building material space if the incumbent players like, say, Finalex Industries, Supreme Industries, if they had focused on the CPVC market early on in, let's say, 2001-2002, the incumbent started thinking PVC is a bigger market. CPVC is an emerging thing. Kyo karna hai? By the time they realized what was going on, the CPVC guys started getting into PVC as well. So today, an astral, I mean, today an astral has actually moved away from a lubrizol and they make their own compound in-house. But so... The mode that an astral has, it is something that has emerged as a result of the business decisions that were taken by the other competitors as well. So if the other players start becoming more aggressive, then what will happen to that mode? Will it weaken? Will it actually get stronger? What sort of investments are those guys making? So APL Apollo, if Tata Pipes had aggressively decided to compete, I mean, at one point of time, I think APL Apollo had a capacity of around 700,000 tons. Tata pipes had a capacity of 500,000 tons, but it's still the same. They haven't really expanded in the past, say, 10 years. So if you can think of an alternative scenario where Tata pipes starts investing into that, then would APL Apollo even have had a moat? I mean, do they really have one today? Would it have been this strong? So I think this entire question to ask is, is this a moat that was created by design by the management? In which case, it's a very, very high quality management. Or did it just emerge? Sometimes you get lucky. My thesis is this. 90% businesses, they get lucky. They hit upon a template that works very well. The incumbents are sitting and, you know, not really focusing on that particular thing. And then, you know, the management actually, the quality actually starts to So if that's the case, if you extend the same logic and let's say if you were sitting and evaluating Asian paints today, I mean, today you look at how the industry structure is actually. You have massive entry of newer players and you actually have a case study like a JSW paints which has scaled up to 1200 crores in no time, which a lot of people thought was impossible even three years ago. They said, Hoi nahi sakta. but today you have that. And then you have a much larger player coming in with a huge capex. So what happens in this case? Look at what's happening in building material. Tileswala wants to get into sanitary wear. Sanitary wear, Kai is getting into bath wear. Okay. You have an astral which has now poached the ED of Sarah sanitary wear and they've put him in charge of expanding the building materials. That's going to hit the market in towards the end of FY23. So you just ask yourself if these are the things that are happening. There's nothing in it for an investor to study the past and then say, okay, this is a mode that has endured. Going forward, what is happening? Are you telling me that a new entrant comes, starts giving twice the margin that I'm giving to the distribution channel? Are you telling me my market share is going to be intact? Are you telling me my growth rate is going to be 15%, which it has historically been? So I guess... These are things. So in the long run, if the growth, let's say, is not dented, but in the medium term, there's a whole amount of disruption that is happening in that particular industry. So I think it makes sense to wear the operating manager's hat. Just keep tracking who is advertising. Okay. Just walk into a nearby store, ask him which company is giving you the best margin, which salesman is coming and pestering you right now. That tells you in terms of what can happen to the growth rates over the next say two years three years and the, finally the holy grail that every investor is really bothered about is just how predictable is the revenue stream of the company i guess eventually all the analysis that we do it just comes down to a basic set of numbers right you ask yourself what is the free cash flow or what is the profit that is going to be generated for the next 10 years is that a growing pool what is the discounting rate and final decision you take is what is the exit multiple that i really want to pay for this multiple so over there, you start thinking in a totally different way over there. So when you're evaluating, let's say, a bank, traditionally, banking is a commodity. 
in theory in practice there is a fair amount of switching cost because you have your bank account that is linked to a credit card credit card pe you have auto pay set up for your for your for your telecom bill for your for your broadband bill for a whole bunch of other things so if i decide to move my assets from one bank to another you have to repoint all of your insurance policies all of your mutual funds you can't just close a bank account overnight you may get absolutely pissed off with the bank but for you to actually move away from that bank and move to a new bank and set up all of these linkages it's a lot of pain so the moat in banking actually comes from there which is where technology becomes very very important once you lock in a customer by offering him more than three products the possibility that is going to move away from the bank is going to be very very low which is why for an hdfc bank you are always happy to you know pay a reasonable valuation because i know that the existing franchise is not going to get disrupted away all that easily and mind you this is in a commodity now when it comes to let's say an fmcg fmcg brand your your brand perception becomes very very important but it has absolutely minimal switching cost as i have said today i can choose to buy a lace tomorrow if i choose to buy an itc kavingo there is nothing that can stop me because but over there the industry structure is going to be very very favorable so you will say okay is kele i can give a slightly higher valuation okay when it comes to let's say it services it products may your sales cycle is very very long it takes 2 years 3 years for core banking we had a 5 year sales cycle i mean you are literally changing the transaction processing engine of a bank you need board level connects i need buy in from the it team i need technical evaluation and finally the board has to be comfortable with my management so but once you are in you are in the last thing any bank wants to do is keep changing their core banking even once in 10 years or get once in 5 years so over there once a deal comes in i know that the revenue flow is going to come in so similarly look at it from a chemicals business point of view for you to crack into a large customer it takes 3 years 5 years but once a customer gives you an loi once the customer says i am nominating you as one of my strategic or long term partners i know that the business will start flowing in execution wise you may do capex for 3 years instead of 2 years so in a chemical business you will say revenue commitment ek bar aa gaya revenue is going to come in what you are not sure about is that the margin spread so margin volatility if it is very high a 25% roc business can become a 15% roc business but b2b may once you are selling to concentrated buying centers where you have a lot of entry barriers once you are in your in business traction tends to come in so look at how chemicals businesses get priced once they signed all these long term contracts the market just priced in the next 3 years ka valuation immediately and then they have been sort of you know staying in that particular range for the next 3 years so this is how the market actually thinks about that final example i want to take about this is this auto ancel this your revenue stream is extremely predictable i mean pick up any any auto ancillary component you will probably have three four players that's about it but the problem is this even if you have 100% market share as an auto ancillary player end of the day you have to go and sell to a tata to a hero or to a bajaj who is probably 10 times your size so the balance of power is always going to be stood in the hands of the oem so in that case what happens is you don't want to assume that your margin profile is going to change drastically because the oem is going to say if you are going to be making a lot of margin of me why can't i do that in house why can't i acquire you so which is why if you look at the components that offer the highest margin and the most repeatable business they are actually focusing on the replacement segment battery guys make 16% ebitda margin a good tires guy can actually make a decent ton of margin i'm saying if you are selling into the export market if you are making components like let's say alloy wheels wagera newer electronic components they are the only segments with an auto ancel be where you will probably make a 14% 15% sort of an ebitda margin so why do auto ancillaries get always trade at a lower valuation this is the reason because the market says even if you capture the entire market your growth rates are only going to be cyclical unless you can prove to me that the category expansion is going to be very very strong otherwise you will only grow at the pace of the market so i guess the final point i want to cover prince is this so when investors want to really value a business what are the inputs that you really want to take into account from a pure fundamental point of view so number 1 is the competitive position competitive position ke liye what do we need 
you need to understand basic numbers and you need to understand from an operating point of view balance of power across competitors with vendors customers and more importantly with an employees second if you come to the revenue growth projections question is can the business really grow faster than the industry what is the historical rate if that's the case what does it really take for the company to grow are you doing discretionary spending like asp because asp is discretionary but it tends to pay off only over the long run whereas btl can move the needle almost immediately but it is not a great strategy in the long run so what sort of hiring and market development models are actually scalable so can you think of a scenario where let's say 20 lakh employees are employed by let's say an it company because it's a linear model right just think of the hr complexity so that should be a very very interesting i would say it's a very important input to your valuation model because that is how you determine whether the growth is going to continue over the long run so then you start thinking in terms of fixed investment so fixed investments usually it's a function of the industry and the technology involved so i guess you can only do a superficial analysis there working capital becomes very very interesting as an i mean look at a page industries look at any of the other innerware makers out there i mean it's it's broad daylight the kind of working capital numbers that page industries does and the numbers that the rest of the industry does because they have been successful in creating number one a pull pro- product even look at the advertising approach you don't know of a single well known model who advertises for page right they tend to use mostly caucasian models because it's an mnc brand and that's the positioning whereas your kolkata based i would say innerware player they spend a lot of money they spend 7% 8% of sales on advertising how effective is that nobody knows even today so asp can be a double edged sword because right. unless you have a means of you know sitting and actually tracking whether it's very effective or not so all of these things you will synthesize and you will say if it is somebody who has a very very strong market position if the balance of power with respect to the distribution channel is always skewed in favor of the oem you can straight away assume that the that a bulk of you know the pat profits are going to translate into operating cash flows whereas for the other guys it will translate but only to the extent of 40% 50% and then this has a direct bearing on the free cash flow that the business generates which once again tends to you know hit your valuation model and you synthesize all of these things and finally you ask yourself the exit multiple that you are actually willing to pay for this do you think it will be in line with historical valuations but if you think from an operating point of view the company is doing all the right things today then you can actually assume that the market will wake up to this fact over a period of time if not today over a period of time so i guess the challenge in this entire model is going to be this what is tangible what is not tangible sometimes you have a very deep understanding but you are not able to synthesize that as a quality as a quantitative input to your valuation model so i think there's a very important distinction that we need to make i can understand an industry far better than anybody else but unless i can synthesize that into an input to my valuation model how does that qualitative edge really translate into anything else? and within my network when i look at some of the best investors that i know of people who think really really long term they do a whole lot of this a whole lot of this because excel sheet work understanding the industry understanding you know the history understanding base rates what the 10 year pe multiple has been this is available to anybody with an internet connection today but fundamental analysis if that's going to be the cornerstone of your investing strategy i guess investors will probably need to start thinking deeper and more importantly make a distinction as to where you actually have an edge and where you don't have an edge so i guess yeah that kind of wraps up the content part which i think i would have wanted to clear so i'm happy to throw the floor open to questions again yeah can i so sashank you had one question on industry structure so you can uh, go next if yeah uh, so can I, i actually had a question uh, regarding the industry structures so you know uh, there were few of the you know the emerging sectors that are coming up so just wanted to have a you know like uh, your view on like you know certain uh, structures like uh, like you know uh, certain sectors like firstly like electronic manufacturing 
then you know you have power sector uh, especially on the infra side especially you know wind and then uh, housing finance insurance and railways so i mean I, i'm not sure if you're covering all these but in case you are so just wanted to have your understanding how we are positioned uh, with respect to these hmm so okay so i think first up i will probably have to confess saying these, these are not the kind of sectors where i have a very deep understanding knowledge myself so that's the first confession that i'll need to make that said i think within the sectors that you named specifically if i look within power i think distribution side it's a very very fuzzy sort of a world i think even on the i mean distribution side is very funny because it's primarily its government owned right generation also is a bit of a problem so i think transmission is where there are very very interesting things right now so because transmission is a very very consolidated space there's a very limited set of vendors there's a lot of modernization that is kind of happening so i think it's an industry that has a lot of tailwinds right now so it's a question of figuring out which part which part of the ecosystem you really want to fit in i think in terms of energy the other area which seems to be very interesting is this so renewables may if you can find a component maker which is a bit of a critical component which everybody needs to use i think that can lead to a specific set of winners in the long run but i think the industry structure is still only evolving over there i think we are still in renewables 1.0 compared to renewables 2.0 so the strike rate for success is not going to be very high over there coming to some of the other themes like data centers i think it's going to be a real real winner it will be a very very solid revenue stream for a lot of component makers so i guess yeah i think in these sectors this is where we have a coverage session. so we are covering power transmission i think even railway modernization is pretty interesting so lot of interesting things that are happening in i think infra building in the country right now so but at the same time these are not sectors that we have tracked for 5 years 10 years so where i can actually claim to have a very deep understanding so i guess ideally i should be answering this question after another maybe not right okay yeah yeah just uh, like you know just to add on to this uh, you said i mean two names of course you know this is not on the you know recommendation side or anything like you oh. know uh, sangmi sangvi movers and salzer uh, you know electronics so do you oh. i mean of course so i'm not saying that you know you you should like you know recommend any of these names do do you mind i mean in case you uh, you don't that to share your views what were your thought process into like these kind of businesses yeah absolutely sir yeah. i think sangvi movers is something that i played as a cycle between 2013 and 2015 because it's very simple i mean within that market segment he is the clear market leader and sangvi movers typically tends to be a medium to late stage sort of a capex story so it's very clear you have an equipment leasing business i see it as an equipment leasing business so what tends to happen is you sit on a fleet of cranes when the demand environment is not very strong you are the yield that you make is not going to be all that great you will be very lucky if you make between 1 to 1.25% per that per month but as the demand environment starts to increase what tends to happen is the entire i would say as the yield starts to increase your your expenses start to get covered so i think over there i see it as a very heavy duty cycle so ideal thought process behind investing into such industries is this you should probably get in when the company is starting to make very very high operating losses but as the utilization starts to increase what will happen is they will show operating losses but then the depreciation which is a non cash flow item so that entire money will be used to pay down the debt so get in over there when the balance sheet is all actually shrinking ride that theme out over a period of time and then get out as the balance sheet is once again in expanded by the manager i think it, it becomes a fairly tactical sort of a call whereas when it comes to salzer i think it's more a call on the industry shashank it's more a call on the industry because somebody is making industrial to scare domestic to scare getting into let's say cables a couple of new areas into the ev space as well so i think these are these are industries that typically the market has not cared for for more than a decade and over there once the growth rate starts showing a very very aggressive sort of a number so i guess salzer i think if i recollect right is talking of a 20% growth rate for the next 2 to 3 years once that happens everything tends to improve something which operates at a 10% 11% roc will suddenly start doing 18% 20% roc so i guess it's a 
it's a play on variant perception rather than on business quality i would put it that way it's a play on variant perception not not so much on business quality and not so much you know about the topic that i have discussed in today's call because it calls for a lot of qualitative ground up work and something it calls for a different model which you can't use because we tend to consume consumer services we tend to consume banking services so we can understand the operating map very well but when it comes to a business like this one which is so far fetched in terms of operations compared to, to our daily lives i think it calls for a slightly deeper element of work so i i i hope i i hope i was able to communicate properly yes yes definitely and and generally when you when you do the portfolio construction what mm-hmm. percentage of your portfolio do you allocate to such kind of businesses you mean the tactical businesses L- like you know like for example like you know these new industries which are proxy plays which are which have not done well for last 10 years and all like when when you construct your portfolio like you know there, there would be something like banking consumption and it where oh. you have the you know under like deeper understanding of the value chain and everything so and and then there are these kind of businesses ideally in portfolio construction what what percentage should be given to these in terms of allocation of capital yeah so once again i would put it this way shashank so if that is the sector that is showing a whole lot of relative strength right now that becomes the first bigger point because i don't think unless you have very deep knowledge you will never be the first guy to actually ride a theme but then we don't need to be the first person as well so this is something that i you know evolved into over a period of time then you do your fundamental work you do 70% 80% of the work you get some sort of a conviction saying there is some sort of a tailwind that is operating so overall i think right now if i had to give you a practical answer 25% is the allocation that we have to these teams purely because i think the rest of the market is fully priced right now by the looks of it so mm-hmm. at the same time if the rest of the market weren't so fully priced i don't think our allocation would have been this high but have been between 10% and 15% but i can't go and buy a high quality consumer business at 70 p today i don't i don't think i can do that so what choices are you left with as an investor so i guess relative attractiveness once you track it at a sector level right now my my qualitative assessment tells me it's a gamble that's worth taking i would put it yeah. perfect Th- thanks a lot kedar that helps Prince Prince I think you're on mute Well Prince can um, you hear us I guess Prince uh, might have some problem yeah. Prince you are there Can I can I slip in one question uh, yeah. there is some message on Bajaj Finance I wanted your view it's very relevant a uh, couple of questions uh, which has been there uh, the, uh Since you mentioned about IT and finance a lot, uh, there was some reading that Bajaj Finance have one of the largest sales force uh, users in India. Is it true? And are they, uh, if not sales force, what kind of other uh, uh, technology uh, they are using, which gives them an edge? Uh, if you can throw some light there. And also, there is one question on uh, what do you think of Bajaj Finance becoming a bank now? uh considering that noise has always been there for the past few years but now their growth rates has uh, tapered off uh say being a nbfc you can grow at 40 35% but if you are now you are reaching a size where you are growing at 20 25% in next few years then is it advisable from their side as well that they now become a bank and how do you see the possibility of that yeah so i guess i think it's a no brainer that it makes sense for them to actually become a bank in the long run and there's a couple of reasons for that obviously taking into account whatever regulatory changes they will need to do and all of that because one of the big disconnects when i have when it comes to the nbfc sisters i mean look at the sources of capital that an nbfc has you take loans from banks from sfps from a whole bunch of other people and then you have to tap into the capital market as well let's just go back to the period of say march or april 2020 i mean franklin templeton amc had an aum of what 30000 35000 crores in those six schemes so 
the credit market the bond markets in india are pretty shallow right now whichever way you look at it so if a large amc was not able to get say 30000 35000 crores of 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 their am of their books in a matter of two years okay and the book wasn't exactly a very bad book the average credit rating was still closer to about a minus or a or whatever it was so i am just asking myself once you cross a loan book of a particular threshold and even if you bring down your reliance on the capital market for funding to a great extent if there were to be some sort of a liquidity event or a credit event in india at some point of time over the next 10 years it will lead to a very very huge sort of an asset liability mismatch so i think that is the question which that which always you know stops me from going heavy duty into any nbfc or that so i guess as a bank the biggest the biggest advantage you have obviously is the access to low cost public money of course that comes with a caveat in terms of higher regulation higher higher oversight by a whole bunch of other things and a greater amount of responsibility towards the society so i guess yeah that's one point which i need to internally reconcile with you know investing in an, an nbfc versus investing into a bank the other point about bajaj finance is this i guess for the longest time the two nbfcs who could raise money in the bond markets in india were hdfc limited and you had uh, and you had uh, bajaj finance now with hdfc limited if it ceases to exist in its current form once the merger goes through what will happen is i think bajaj finance will actually have a tailwind in terms of raising capital from the corporate markets but is that the right thing to do with a 10 year point of view i am really not sure i'm really not sure on that so coming coming to the other point about your about the technology investment and sales was so to be honest i don't think i have done that sort of granular work on bajaj finance because it's always looked overpriced to me i mean it's it's it's, it's it doesn't really fit into my way of doing it. so let me put it that way so apologies for that i will not be able to offer any sensible or deep comment on it. right kira so manish you can unmute and ask a question ravi you have any follow up yeah one follow up since we were discussing nbfc and bank how do you see uh, competition between uh, or competition metrics changing between nbfc and bank uh, for three four reason that uh, say costs of uh, borrowing for banks have gone up so nbfc will have some kind of additional spread if they make then banks uh, for some reason uh, they have become aggressive in few of the pockets where nbfc used to lead earlier say it's gold loan or or even they are trying on the retail side so uh, will nbfc find it difficult because uh, a larger balance sheet is now aggressive in this segment uh, uh, what's your view on that and since rbi in last one year or so some, not not one year but six months uh, they have reduced the leeway which nbfc used to enjoy in terms of asset quality and uh, that 90 day period where uh, classification of gnp and npa used to happen now nbfc also has to work like a bank so uh, it becomes difficult for a, for a nbfc to grow at a faster pace they used to grow earlier so any any color you want to add on these questions yeah so i would broadly agree saying the banks are also building capabilities as a state right i guess the whole business model of nbfc was to fill in the white spaces that were there in the indian market where people needed money and for some reason the banks were not will, willing to or they were not able to focus on that particular pocket but eventually anything like a gold loan which is to be honest i guess it's one of the li- lesser riskier forms of lending in india so i guess over there the competition as you clearly see has really gone up significantly i mean leading gold loan nbfcs were lending at 22% 23% so today you have a nbfc like an ifl finance who's looking to let's say lend at 17% 18% so they have a co lending tie up so i think a lot of innovation in terms of you know market outreach is going to come through there's no longer any sort of a distinction plus other thing is this look at how the banking landscape has changed in the country i guess for the longest time banking licenses were very very hard to come by i think you had something like a decade where only three banking licenses were given out and then you came into the raghuram rajan era where he just said banking licenses are going to be given out on tap 
otherwise what would happen was every 6 months you would have a meeting all the incumbent incumbent bankers would come in and effectively a new guy couldn't find a seat at a table right so sfbs as a category payment banks as a category i think the regulator is very very clear saying end of the day i need the customer or i need the end consumer to actually get the best possible deal so i completely agree so it's going to be very very competitive and nbfcs obviously will have to you know innovate and they'll have to figure out a way of staying competitive in the pockets where the banks are getting it so it's not going to be all that easy anymore whether it's not Oh, thank you, Dad. I will move in uh, listen only mode. What are you, Prince? Thank you, Ravi. So, so Kedar, like uh, when we analyze uh, business one time and say after some time we revisit that business. So, what changes as far as uh, analysis is concerned, and how how one can decouple from the biases uh, of uh, previous analysis uh, to the same business? How how one should about it? yeah so i guess it's it, it makes sense to do this in a structured manner so ideally speaking it should be done every every year i mean once a year is where you actually let's say sit down with the annual report of that particular company you would have already been going through all the conference calls in real time so i think it makes sense to just ask ourselves some basic question saying management will say a whole bunch of things where are they actually putting their money are they putting their money into capex are they putting their money into advertising spends or are they putting their money into doling out higher and higher incentives to the channel so everything put together i guess generally if it's a trend that is getting cemented especially if it's an adverse trend we should be able to catch it if not in the first year at least in the second year so in that case what happens is so then you will not be caught in a situation where you pay a 70p for a business and then you hold it all the way till the market actually brings it down to 30p so i think it makes sense for every investor to have a structured framework so number one track the developments on a on a on a on a on a, on a tangible basis and do this exercise every year at least for the companies that you are invested into along with the set of competition it's a very very comprehensive exercise and the output of that has to be that you have to revisit whatever valuation models you have built as a fundamental investor another layer i would put on top of it is obviously you should be reading technical trends at least on a regular basis because sometimes what happens is we will not be able to place the exact finger on that but the market is already starting to you know derate certain businesses or let's say rerate certain businesses so if the cost for rerating or if the cost for derating is not let's say is not let's say apparent to us with a superficial reading then it is time to actually think deeper and to once again start thinking in terms of the operating manager so i guess it just comes down to putting that structured framework in place and to be honest i guess this is something that i have also struggled i don't know if i have a perfect fail safe mechanism right now but we can only get better over it right so i guess a combination of fa combination of trend reading over a period of time should kind of you know at least increase our strike rate of being able to be calibrated to the market rate right? at the same time at the same time just to add another caveat sometimes what happens is the business quality or the business strength doesn't really waver too much so i guess a classic case is an itc i mean what is different about itc today compared to what oh, it was 3 years ago it's not drastically different obviously the outlook for some of their business segment is far better today but other than that can you really explain a drop in the valuation multiple from 34 at its peak to a level of 13 at the bottom when the dividend yield was closer to 6% probably not so i guess it's very important to make the distinction saying is it happening because of clear cut fundamental reasons or is it just that the market is in a very very bad mode with respect to this business or sector right now so i guess right now chemicals as a sector is going through that phase where the market is in a very very bad mode with respect to certain businesses financialization went through that sort of a trend for the past couple of years i think it's finally starting to change to some extent so very complicated exercise but that's the whole point we need to think through from a variety of perspectives use whatever edge you can get use data use use industry level analysis to wear this operating hat look at technical analysis whatever can alert you to something that is changing in the mix is very very important
Yeah, friends, we can't hear you. Are you able to hear you? Yeah, Kita, you are audible. I think. Uh, I guess yeah, friends is probably having a bit trouble. Yeah, some issue on that side. Okay, so in the meanwhile, so I guess any of the other people who have been enabled as speakers, so any other question you would want to throw at me, I guess I have another ten to fifteen minutes because we before we'll have to wrap up this discussion. So happy to take. any questions till the time prince manages to connect back so yeah, you just got a message from prince that i can handle he is having some issues so guys any one of you have uh, having any question uh, vinith manish so Yeah, I think uh, so. I'm just uh, reading the Twitter chat to see if there are any questions that which we can pick up to answer in the meanwhile. Kita, I uh, can I may I slip in one question? Please, please, Prashant? yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, since we are discussing about FMCG, uh, uh, say if if we pick up the uh, the premium players like HUL, which is I don't know, maybe sixty sixty five. Uh, trailing P multiple. Uh, what, according to you, uh, uh, should be an ideal P multiple for a business which can grow at where profit might grow at ten percent, something like that in the range, uh, and they generate decent amount of free cash flow. Uh, also, the risk which you which you perceive given given the modern trades are coming up, which will squeeze the margin for FMCG players. Uh, uh and and when we anchor our thought on hul uh we also see a nestle uh, where which is uh, 20 25% premium because uh, on hul you, if you can take a 10 15 year visibility for growth nestle is still a premium urban pockets product uh the visibility for growth might be even higher or maybe it is just a float reason for a premium valuation where do you or or if you take a example of colgate which is a much more saturated a single line product uh, uh which trades at 35 40 p multiple uh but generates a decent amount of fcf and uh growth is uh, smaller than the other two uh, where should the valuation thought construct should uh, uh, like add up what's your view yeah so i guess i think fmcg looked at it purely from the lens of business analysis and even thinking as an operating manager i think it's one of the very few business segments in india where you can actually bet for the long term i mean till about let's say 2 3 years ago there was this entire narrative where people said d2c brands are going to come and you know disrupt fmcg but i don't see that happening because the final game plan for a d2c brand seems to be a stake sale to an fmcg so i think eventually it is not a product category expansion problem it is not a market facing problem i guess it's purely a call on valuation that it comes down to i think the fundamental disconnect that i have with how fmcg businesses have been valued starting from 2016 is this i guess what happened in 2016 now i'll have to go off into a little bit of macro here so 2016 is when trump came into power I think the next six months, what happened was you had a one hell of a rally in commodity prices. There was this entire trade war narrative with China, so the U.S. Fed actually hiked rates, and then they did a very very quick reversal. I guess that's where the back of the entire inflation narrative got broken, and that's where the and that's where every single bear in the bond market threw in the towel. So, if you see, starting from that day, starting from 2016, 2017, is where the valuation of all of these FMCG companies actually started reaching a crescendo in terms of the PE multiple. Now, coming to your specific question, I guess first and foremost, it comes to a view on what do you think the discount rate needs to be over the long term for an FMCG business. So, a business that can grow at let's say 10%, 12%. I don't think ROC is ever going to be a problem for an FMCG business. The ROC will always be high. It will always be twenty-five percent plus, thirty percent plus, whatever that number is. The issue is going to be the amount of cash flow that you generate. What are you going to do with it? Can you reinvest that back into the business and deliver a higher growth rate? In which case, I wouldn't mind paying a sixty p. But that is, that does not seem to be the case. So end of the day, the cash comes and sits on the balance sheet. 
these guys will either do some sort of an acquisition but the acquisition is going to be of a smaller ticket size it's not going to move the needle at the growth rate level so healthy roc growth rates which are actually i would say maybe 2% lower than the nominal gdp of the country so ideally if i believe that the discount rate should be closer to 12% then you wouldn't want to pay anything more than 35 to 40 p but if your view on the discount rate is that the fiis who are the one of the bigger components of you know the holders in any of these high quality stocks if you can think of an environment where the global interest rates actually once again fall to a very very low level where the cost of capital for them if they start working with a slightly lower discount rate then maybe a pe of 60 can be justified but it's a very very difficult to bet to make right now so that's where i would probably differ in terms of how i would value this business compared to a whole bunch of other people out there in the market that said if you buy any of these highly valued businesses today if you can actually hold them for a period of 10 years 15 years i think you'll make a decent amount of money you may not make 20% 25% compounded you'll make a decent amount of money in in line with the nifty growth rate 11% 12% per annum so i guess it just comes down to a view on interest rates because on business quality in terms of operational effectiveness i don't think i will disagree with anybody out there it's purely a call on discount rate. right kedar sorry for the trouble in between so so kedar there is one interesting question from sahir sachdev so he's asking considering you love traveling so uh, any any investment ideas uh, you get uh, on your travels or anything that you noticed from investment point of view which changed your investing framework or philosophy yeah so that's a very interesting question obviously so i can just talk of one trip that i did in 2016 which kind of totally changed my thinking about the chinese economy so 2016 is where i did a 15 day china tour with a friend who was working in bc at that point of time so i guess we spent 4 days in shanghai 4 days in beijing 4 days in hong kong just a couple of days transit here and there so we were meeting investors we were meeting people who were running pe funds vc funds entrepreneurs over there within the digital banking ecosystem and some public market investors as well so over there the one thing that really stood out to me was this everybody kept using this particular term in the chinese language i think it's called guashi which means the indian term for that is jugad so they said you can you you can be the best you can be the best entrepreneur out there if you are not in the good books of the powers that actually run this country you will never succeed in the long run i guess it suddenly hit me saying there are 100 entrepreneurs that ran the race for every single business segment in china but the real two three big winners were hand picked by the government so i came back and i said ki boss chinese market is pricing all of their market leading businesses like a psu so my advice to one of my entrepreneur friends was this if you are going to be raising capital in the next say one year please don't take money from a chinese investor because eventually the regulator is going to come down very hard on this entire conduit of capital because the problem is this there's a difference between a chinese entrepreneur and a us entrepreneur once again you can call me bias but this was my big takeaway the us entrepreneur owes his allegiance to money he his loyalty is towards his money so tomorrow if the us regulator starts cracking down on him he will give up his us citizenship shift to barbados cayman islands mauritius any of those tax havens maybe go to malta somewhere else but he will not change with the way he goes about doing things he will not change his world view with a chinese investor it's totally different so if i have a chinese investor and i am a fintech company and he has access to my data it is as good as the chinese government having access to my data so this is something that was very very clear to me after that particular trip so in addition to that there is one more occupational hazard that you have in terms of being an investor so let's say you are sitting in some good resort you are you are sitting on a beach shack you tend to do all sort of stupid calculations you tend to calculate how many people are sitting in this beach okay what is the utilization capacity utilization of this particular hotel how much revenue is this guy cracking per day at what level is he going to turn profitable so there's a lot of occupational hazards as well 
traveling i would say is a is a very interesting thing if you are visiting a uh, economy so i visited vietnam in 2016 as well so 2016 we did about 7 days in vietnam so i guess two three days in hanoi three days in ho chi minh city and a couple of days in hoa ha so vietnam looked like a brilliant investment opportunity at that point of time i mean people were really really aspirational you get the feeling that this is a developing economy which can actually deliver through the roof in the next 10 years so my sense is this next as of now what we are seeing is we are seeing a whole lot of tourism inflow of indians into vietnam over the next 5 years i my sense is vietnam will emerge as an interesting investment destination for a whole lot of south east asia business so yeah traveling tends to broaden your perspective traveling tends to give you certain inputs which you can which you can't really get by sitting in the house and you know reading a whole bunch of books not even by reading vietnam is books go there experience things for like 3 4 days you will tend to come to certain conclusions which are generally right once you see things for yourself on the ground yeah all right so kedar uh, how good we are on time we have some questions in the comments which we can take quickly if you allow or uh, we take them I next guess, i guess we can maybe take another three more questions uh, yeah okay okay so there is one question like uh, how do you look at investing in unlisted companies or startups to get best cost arbit- arbitrage for retail investor from long term investment with clarity on exit ha huh, so unfortunately you see the my take is this you are not going to get everything in one single shot either we will get good entry prices if you get a good entry price then the possibility is that you are buying you are investing when the when the particular segment is not doing all that well so you will have a whole bunch of sleepless nights in terms of whether this company is actually going to survive for the next 5 years and exit is something that we don't really have too much of a clue on the problem is this i think in indian market what's happening is every single segment of investing is pretty well discovered right now i guess for the longest time if an entrepreneur wanted to raise capital in india you just had to list in the stock market that was the only way of crowd sourcing i would say capital but in the last 15 years vc has taken off pa has taken off so i think every single idea out there which is worth funding we are competing for a piece of stake in that business with respect to angels with respect to vcs with respect to pas and that part of the ecosystem is unfortunately not very democratic it's very very elitist the best of the deal flow goes to the most well known entrepreneurs or well known investors over there so if that person puts in the deal gets circulated within his network as well so i guess it's going to be a problem in the deal flow front the best investment ideas are not going to come to you the ideas that come to you won't probably be the businesses that are best placed to do very well over the next 10 years so overall i think it is not an area that i would personally want to patient because if i am wrong how do i get my money out it's a very very it's a very very tricky sort of a thing so i would prefer to continue to fish in public markets until i get to a stage where i have that sort of a strong network where i can get a good deal, good deal so because it's not a democratic market it's a very very elitist market it actually works like a cut that's been my observation right great so guys uh, you you hardly get to listen to such uh, deep levels uh, deep level second level thinking so do give us a follow to our guest for today kedar and kedar uh, the last question uh, around uh, um, i mean that is general not specific to the topic basically so which sectors from here you see can do good in say next one or two years and on the top of that uh, there are uh, many many attendees who are just beginning their uh, career in investing right so what would be your advice to uh, all of them yeah yeah so i guess the answer to the first question is this i think there's a whole bunch of sectors that have been out of work for such a long time that investors have forgot on about them so infrastructure epc players capital goods power transmission equipment so these are sectors where i see visibility of 20 25% earnings growth rate in an absolute sense in an optical sense the business valuation seems to be closer to 25 but once the total fi 23 and the next 12 months come in i think forward p is still closer to around 
13 to 14 for a whole lot of businesses so i think all the right ingredients are there limited ownership by a whole lot of funds and by retail investors you have good earnings visibility coming in you have a government which is actually serious and more importantly i think we see that evidence on the ground in terms of improving order book order books are getting significantly better for people people are doubling their order books every 2 years so and as long as you have a government that is serious about doing execution so long as gst collections continue to be pretty good the system has a lot of money to spend i think the order books will start translating into revenue pretty quickly so i think those are the sectors where i think i would want to spend the bulk of my time obviously that doesn't mean we should ignore the more stable sectors like fmcg or let's say even it services or banking so i would say yeah these economy facing sectors in combination with certain i would say financials that seem to be reasonably priced i think that is where i would probably want to fish for the next one or one or one or two years and coming to the other part of the question i guess as i have said prince in my intro i think if you are an investor starting your investing journey today you can read books you can listen into podcasts you can probably pick those two three practitioners who probably appeal to you at a philosophical level understand how they go about doing things so many courses that are actually available start allocating some part of your capital make your mistakes initially at a small scale i guess it's very important for people to actually stay the course so i think when i began my investing journey i guess the kind of mistakes that i have heard today i would probably be extremely ashamed of that but trust me i have lost my money to the extent of 80% 90% chasing all sorts of stupid stories out there and that continued till i started doing things in a very very formal and a very very structured sort of a manner so my advice to people would be get a very good base of you know investing theory down initially beyond that it's a question of staying the course and start doing structured work to the extent possible so when i say structured work initially it can be something like a simple one or two page investment note that you write for yourself you don't have to put it on social media you don't have to send it out to anybody just write that note where you tell yourself what do you like about this business what do you think is a decent valuation for this and keep maintaining an investment diary because once you put things in black and white you can't fool yourself five years down the line i still maintain an investment diary and when i look at some of the comments that i wrote five years ago i feel like an absolute total fool but it's part of the investing it's part of the investing journey so i guess the more important thing is this by the two year three year mark i guess people will figure out saying do i like investing or not because if you like investing just think long term about it keep upgrading your skill sets keep doing things in a very very structured manner every two years you should be adding a new skill to yourself so let's say you start off being a fundamental investor two sal kar lo then you start doing let's say structured work another two years you start learning technical analysis or let's say you start off as a technical guy you start off as a day trader swing trader and all of that then you start understanding things fundamentally then you start doing a fair amount of work just the very fact if you can show me a young guy today who says i have read the annual report of this company and of their competitors if you can tell me what is the industry size if you can tell me who are the top 5 players if you can tell me what the growth rate of that particular sector is if you have read through the annual reports if you read through the recent conference calls trust me you are better off compared to 90% of the people who invest and then you kind of build it up over a period of time so i guess it's a journey friends it's a journey where incrementally either you like it or you don't if at any point of time if you figure out saying i don't want to do this please put your money into a mutual fund or an index fund or work with an advisor pursue this as a hobby but if you are willing to put in that work i still think alpha generation in india can continue to work for the next say a decade or so I mean it's futile to talk about anything more than a decade but yes i think there's a lot of work that you can do and once you pick up those skills it starts translating into some of the decisions that you make in your personal life as well in your professional career as well and the sort of discussions that you can have with your senior management i mean just think of a situation where you are a 24 25 year old guy you have this all hands meeting where let's say your skip level guy comes in okay everybody else is asking him superficial questions you start throwing intelligent questions at him saying sir this seems to be happening in our industry 
this is what that ceo has said just think of the impression that you will be creating on your super boss people will walk away thinking who's this guy interesting chap so it allows you to stand out so do the work like what you are doing things will fall into place over a period of time that's great, all i would like to sum up uh, this great session uh, <laughs> kedar so kedar uh, like uh, any any points you want to tell our attendees about i mean so the framework is very much clear you explained it brilliantly but again if you want to say something about congruence uh, advisors uh, please feel free to say yeah so let's spend so i guess whatever i want to say it's pretty much there on the website as well in terms of how we think what exactly is our model and all of that i would definitely encourage everybody to read through our blog posts follow us on the on the twitter page because over a period of time you will figure out saying is this something that you are philosophically aligned with so i think that's a very important aspect of working with the right advisor because sometimes what happens is uh, somebody who's an advisor to you either on your taxes or on your legal side or let's say even on your finances they tend to become a good sounding board for you over a period of time so i have seen that happen with a lot of people so i would encourage people to you know read multiple sources please go through our publications as well i think over a period of 2 to 3 years you'll figure out who are the people that you are philosophically inclined towards if you find somebody who you think is worth your time i think it's definitely worth sticking around and you know working with them with a long term point of time that's all i would probably want to say so i encourage everybody to maybe just go through the website if you haven't already and i guess we'll keep interacting so i guess the world is a pretty small place Uh, all of us are committed to becoming good investors so i guess there's multiple opportunities we can go into great great it is always uh, great to connect and build a strong network in uh, investing <laughs> fraternity so so kedar before we allow you to leave any any good literature two three books which had a great impact in your investing or maybe you want to suggest to our attendees before we leave hmm. so i think if you want to understand the basis of how central banking works so there's this very very controversial sort of a book that is called the creature from jekyll island it 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 documents the history of how many attempts it actually took for people to institute a central banking environment across the entire world so do read that to understand the basic concepts of money basic concepts of fractional reserve banking and how there's a lot of other perspectives that are involved when it comes to com- controlling the money supply of a country i guess the other few set of books is obviously you should be reaching you should be reading people like peter lynch you should be reading warren buffett you should be reading michael mavosin for sure in terms of you know building building a view on the industry industry analysis do stick to basic frameworks by morning star i would say even 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 Porter's five forces framework is as comprehensive as it actually gets. When it comes to valuation, once again, I would reiterate Michael Mabuson's notes, absolute gold mine of information. So uh, it tends to bring you perspectives that are very important. And once you read those notes, you tend to, you know, actually figure out how to relate the aspects of business analysis to valuation. So that is very, very important. So I guess. these sources if you can read and one other source i guess people should definitely read is please read the alchemy of finance it's a very well known book i'm sure many people have read it but the first 100 pages of the book if you can make sense of it very talks of this sense of reflexivity i guess that was the one which actually sort of you know gave me that aha moment saying this is what the markets actually discount so when people say the market is a discounting machine this is how it works this is how the players actually express their views and the i, I guess the remaining 75% of the book is actually his own personal diary in terms of how he thinks in terms of macro environment absolutely brilliant in addition to that obviously reading people like nasim taleb is very interesting to understand to understand things from a risk point of view i guess if this set of reading is done and if you do multiple readings of these books i guess 80% of investing more or less covered and then it comes out to how much hard work we actually put in on the ground in terms of practicing everything